What do you desire? To design the most beautiful women's clothing that ever existed. Christian Dior ruined French couture, and I'm coming back to save it. For those of us who lived through the chaos of war, creation was survival. The legend of Coco Chanel. The people only knew. If I keep on giving them lips that can kill, they gon' have to come and arrest me. Chanel can be very treacherous. Oh, yes. My heart. Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Robin Gavon. I'm the senior critic at large here at The Post. And it's my pleasure to be joined today by actor Ben Mendelsohn, who plays Christian Dior in The New Look. Thanks for being here, Ben. It's a pleasure, Robin. Thanks for having me. Um, I, Dior is one of the best known names in fashion, known even to people who have uh, never walked into a, a fashion boutique. But I'm wondering if you can, for those few people who don't sort of know a lot about him, can you kind of give us the, the thumbnail of um, sort of the, who he was and sort of what the series is about? Certainly, he's um he's the middle child of a uh, of a family that was quite a, a wealthy family. They um they have hit uh, hard times. Christian, before we see him, has worked in like an art gallery, um, uh, tried to start his own art gallery, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he is working for a a man called Lucien Lelon, who is a very important uh, haute couture. Uh, designer, um, and he has a number of people working under him. He has his sister, Catherine, with him. His sister, Catherine, is a resistance fighter, and that's where we start. And I'm curious, what drew you to the character of Dior? I mean, what was your relationship with fashion like before taking on this role? Uh, my relationship with fashion was, do I wear ACDC T-shirt or do I wear a Led Zeppelin T-shirt? Um, <laughs> I'm from Melbourne, um, uh, so it, but not, 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 particularly, not particularly deep. I made a show called Bloodline many years ago mm -hmm. uh, with, 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 a, with Adam Kessler, who had done Sopranos, he'd done Damages, um, and he was at my place. He was making a pizza. And he told me he'd read the autobiography of uh, Christian Dior, and he said he spoke about one thing, and that was did his relationship between his real self and the self that he had to adopt or to be in the world and um, uh, sell his dresses and stuff. And he really hated himself for it. And I said to him, "Well, when do we start? When do we start?" And then waited for five years, hoping that we'd get to do it, and we did. We did get to do it, and I couldn't be happier. Were there particular reasons why it took so long, or was it that just sort of the nature of the beast? That's uh, that's uh, that's how that's how it goes, you know. It yeah. has to be. I mean, that that was that was the initial conversation, and then um, Adam was working on a bunch of other things. He was writing a bunch of stuff at that time, mm -hmm. and um, it just happened that the new look is the one that uh, was the one to go. So we uh, we boarded for Paris, and off we went. And one of the things that I, I thought was really interesting is that, uh, I mean, and he's spoken about this, the importance of actually filming on location, being in some of those places where Dior actually worked and walked. I mean, how does that feed into your ability to bring a character like that to life? I think we were, we were really, um, we were really firm on wanting to do the entire thing in Paris um, for the ambiance, quite, quite simply. Mm -hmm. um, it's not so much being able to be where Christian was is is wonderful because it just lends um, uh, it lends a specificity and an authenticity to the feeling of what we're doing, et cetera, et cetera. But it's more important because the audience gets to see the real spots, um, and that's um, and that's a real bonus. You know, that's a real bonus. Very rarely do you get the opportunity to do that, but. You know, it um, it paid off big time. One of the things that I have typically found, and, and this is just my opinion, but um, it always seems that when filmmakers begin to tackle a fashion subject, 
uh, designers have a tendency to come across as either dreadfully ponderous or incredibly high strung and histrionic. And you have managed not to do either of those extremes and yet really convey the complexity of, of Dior. I mean, how did you walk that fine line? Because he does have his high drama moments. Oh, he certainly does. He certainly does. I mean, I think we we weren't we weren't doing this from the standpoint of making something about fashion. Um, nor were we doing something about the war and the occupation. Um, but it's just to remember that um, he's um it was just to try and focus in on who 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 the person seemed to be and who we you know how he was being written and what I'd seen of him, and just to try and play the scenes. And you know, really, um, it's um, it's quite thrilling at times. It's quite horrifying at times. It's it's um, it's a fantastic show. It's uh, it's a fantastic show, and um, and it's sort of a, it's a little uninteresting to have um, um, you know, to take it here or take it there. I think it's you know, you you, you I, I want you know, I want an audience to be able to connect with um whoever it is and in order to do that um you know you just want to try and stitch as much as you can inside so that it's just there and hopefully it translates and people are able to um forget everything else and just go for the ride i mean you the the series really i mean comes to dior at an unfathomable time in his life in in the history of the world, really. I mean, how were you? How surprised were you, or challenged were you by the ways in which he survived? It was very challenging. I mean, in terms of just making it, there were there were two weeks, uh, particularly um, that were the hardest I'd ever worked, and and perhaps perhaps some of the best some of the best work I think. Um, um he, he went through an incredibly incredibly difficult time but he was um he didn't know what you know he didn't know what he was doing he was just trying to to get this thing done um his sister is um you know his sister he is, is separated um and he needs to get her back and um As and he's also he was uh, his sister was resistance uh part of the resistance and she was sent to a labor camp. She was, and and that was that was devastating. And um, his relationship, their relationship is very close. They're kind of a bit of a pain in the butt to each other, as any kind of siblings are, <laughs> are that are very close. But the absence of uh, that sibling is just devastating for for him. Um, you know, it's his little sister. Um, and he's, you know, been telling her, do this, don't do that. You know, he's a bit of a, he's a bit, he's a bit of a um, controller in that, in that sense. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, and, and it's to try and, um, you know, just, yeah, to, to, to just get under the hood. And, and the other thing is, is when you, when, well, certainly when I'm acting, I'm not acting from a place that where things are definite. I'm just sort of trying to, you know, offer up a proposition. Maybe it's like this, maybe it's like that. And so, you know, amongst all those propositions, hopefully there's enough to to go. Okay, this seems to to track out well. So that's it. I think we have um, not to give too much away, but I think we have a little uh, bit of a, a clip from um, uh, a scene in which uh, Dior is trying to uh, bring his sister home. Um, I think, and the uh, Catherine Dior is played by Maisie Williams, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. Christian, you're working tonight. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were here. I'm minding the atelier. I fear people will break in and steal what little we have. I'm sorry, I... I, I need something to barter for Catherine, so I was taking your fabrics. Just a moment. Take 
this one as well. Christian should have some value. Find your sister, and then afterwards, come back and make the house of Le Long a success once more. Good luck. Yeah, I mean, I think that scene is is so powerful and heartbreaking, and just the subtlety that in which you you play it. But it also, I think, speaks to sort of the value and the esteem that fashion was held in. This idea that these fabrics were valuable enough that they could be bartered. I mean, what what role did you sort of see fashion and sort of the creative enterprise uh, playing in uh, in this in the telling of this story? Well, I think it um, it what what it what it the, the what it plays is it's incredibly powerful and it can be used in a way to sort of mollify this sort of occupying force so they don't um, obliterate us. But it's in, also it's in, incredibly valuable specifically at this time to be able to give something that's sort of beautiful and elegant um, it's a Christian drifting through I hadn't seen that scene it's um, um I think um that really as he says to him creation was life and I think he was able to hold on to threads of hope um by by working and um you know, it was a very, uh, this was really the period of hot culture. So it's very, um, you know, it's very much an, an, an upper class or thing. And it's for um, for people with, um, with significant wealth and um, significant time on their hands. There were seven changes of costume a day uh, was the correct amount of um, changes. So there was a lot of cloth involved. Yeah. And of course, um, it's very scarce. We're in a time of real scarcity. I mean, when the series opens, uh, a rather sort of ballsy student uh, asks this question of Dior and sort of challenges him. And mm. she says that, you know, Chanel closed her boutique, closed her business during the war, but that Christian, who was working for Le Long, um, continued to work and continue to design and dress uh, members of the Nazi party. And she presents that as this sort of clearly defined good and evil juxtaposition. Yes. yes. I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about how the series really reveals that it's not quite that much of a, it's not quite that simple. Yes. And in that, we are very much um, contemporary and we're making this for people right here, right now. We're not making a document that's a, about history per se. Um, look, he was working for Lucien Le Long and sometimes there were, there were wives or girlfriends of uh, Nazi officers um, that wanted to uh, have a lovely gown. And who were they going to go to? They were going to go to Lucien Le Long or this person here or this person there. Uh, Christian was nothing in particular. He was a well-regarded designer inside the uh, Le Long house. And um, he did, he, he preferred not to. He would have much rather not to. But, um, but you know, it's that or, or don't eat. And on the other hand, uh, Coco did shut her. She did shut her shop, um, but there are other there are other issues that um, you know are more complex. And what we're we're very, I think both characters are very much loved by those of us that um, made this. Um, but they are they are differentiated, and that's not to to be uh, that's not a moral thing. We're not we're not mm -hmm. trying to. We're not, we're not Aesop, we're not trying to paint a moral fable or all that hoo-ha. But it is a very interesting look at these two um, titans of, uh, of fashion um, and, uh, and a take on 
how how they came up, well, particularly Christian, but at that stage, Coco is really the, the preeminent and, you know, and very, very possibly, you could still say, remains the preeminent mm -hmm. name in fashion. And um, Well, I don't know. Dior might say <laughs> otherwise. But, but. <laughs> well, no, no, but Christian, Christian has, has um, you know, Christian comes from really comes from next to nothing in terms of where he occupies the space in fashion. You know, he, the, there's a circle of friends. There's Balenciaga, there's Belmont, et cetera, et cetera. A, a number of very significant designers that all hung out, they were all close. Um, and um, and Coco was not part of that set. She was she had her own thing going on. Um, but they were all sort of beginning at this stage. Um, and, um, you know, he Christian is essentially headhunted by, by um, by a venture capitalist who says, you know, you should think about doing your own thing. And he's like, but he also knows it's either, he either jumps and does it or miss out. And um, he doesn't seem very ambitious, but way back here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah, very much, very, very much. Yeah, and I mean, and you see some of that as he begins to to build the business, and there's this hesitation to sort of uh, demand the sort of building that he really wants to establish yeah. his his business in. But then he also decides that if he's going to get this done, he's got to get some seamstresses from somewhere. I mean, yeah. One of one of the things that I found interesting, another thing I found interesting is that Dior is sort of surrounded by this group of male companions. I mean, he's yeah. gay, he has his boyfriend, but he also yeah. has this group of male friends. And yeah. Chanel very much sort of talks about the challenges of being a woman at this time and starting a business. How much of a subtext was that dichotomy in the series? This sort of male, female, the male gaze, the male designer, the male saying, I want to design the most beautiful clothes as I see them, you know, for women. Yeah. I think one of the things I really did love about um, uh, about this group of men and uh, and particularly David Cumminen, who plays Jacques, my 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 you know Christian, my whatever lover, <laughs> um, um, and because it was a type of a uh, it was a type of a closeness or a male relationship that um, that I don't I feel like we we haven't quite seen it played this way, but in a way that it's not referred back to, it's not. Um, it's not we don't we don't go into what it's like in the culture or anything like that. We just have them together and um, and yes, and the idea, look, Coco Chanel changed the world of the way women dress, and there is no one that can take that away in any way, shape or form. Christian has very, you know, has his own kind of take on what beauty is and what elegance is, et cetera, et cetera. It's very personal to him, though, because in a way, what all he's really trying to do is get back his mum and his childhood time and his family. So the space that he designs it from is from his mother's garden and the shapes of the flowers, the smells. Uh, Miss Dior, which he launched uh, along with the, 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 the show that became the new look, the collection, should I say. Um, they're all drawn directly from you know, what's really beautiful and important to him. And and thus it is. And I think the idea of, you know, that we look at now and say, well, these were a bunch of men dressing women and this was, there was a woman dressing women and what's right and what's not. That's 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 for you. That's the audience. And, um, you know, and, but um, but I can assure you of this. If you go on this ride, there is. Um, there's a very thrilling and um, you know, surprisingly um, difficult and emotional, awesome kind of journey to go on. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you you mentioned that there were a couple of weeks that were particularly challenging uh, for you to film. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, you just saw the scene, and really, um, as soon as, once Kathleen is taken away, he that's it. He that nothing else is interesting. Nothing else captures any attention. It is just I have to get her back. And 
look, I think as we know, that's um, that's a uh, that's pretty slim odds. However, Coco Chanel has been able to retrieve her nephew from a similar situation. So, Christian is is there must be some way. The time once we're dealing with once we get to the point where he's stealing the fabrics from Le Long, and that scene is really um, is really nice. So I, I I'd not seen it before. Um, and what follows on from there is really quite. Um, It's tough. Yeah. What happens is tough, you know, and um, and it continues to be tough for a while. So while when we were filming that, we we just tried to we tried the whole we, we tried a, a, a real range. We really tried to to go um, to absolute catastrophic devastation, and and back, you know, to to allow the you know the the storytellers to. Um, construct what they um, what they felt was the most effective way of co conveying it. But what what I didn't want to leave on the table was, and in fact, what Helen Shaver would not let me leave on the table. And I I can never thank her enough for for you know till she till she got <laughs> everything she wanted, and that was a hallmark of her that she would never leave it until she could really feel it and went okay good. That was that was very very good, and off we would go. But it was incredibly emotional. It was relentlessly. Um, um, it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of. Um, it's hard work. It's hard work when it's like that, because we work with emotions, and emotions are um, <clears throat> well, they're signalling something, right? When you're emotional, what you're doing essentially is signalling to the other the other humans. I require this, or I require that, or go away, come close, whatever it is. And that remains in us, whether or not there's uh, there's someone around to to help. And there's no one to help in reality. There he has people around, but they're not they're not available at the time that he's going through um, um what he goes through. Oh. And and I mean it also seems like it. Uh, you know, that's one of the the scenes that sort of speaks to the complexity of uh, the situation, the choices that people have made. Yeah. And it, it also seems to, I think, speaks to contemporary times where people have to make impossible choices. Yeah, I think we all have values. We all have uh, convictions. We all have moral, uh, we all have a moral compass and we all have... Um, our, you know, our who we are and what we'll do and what we won't do. And then reality. And we adjust. We meet reality and we must adjust to reality because you can have an, any idea that you like of yourself, but at some point if, when we intersect with reality, we, um, we adapt to reality because that's where that's where things actually get done or don't get done and so these ideas of uh, who we are and what we are etc cetera, etc cetera, and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing um and where that intersects with reality and what that actually means um is is really what is really is really the the um the bit of the show i think that's the the richest and the most kind of um and leave and can leave you with the most kind of like oh you know because what would you do and essentially that's the heart of the the program and to me it's about well how do you be in life you know like how are you in life what do you do when the world feels hostile you don't feel great about yourself you've got you know you've got these you know you want to be a good person you want to and you are are you a good person are you are, or are you not like that kind of stuff um and that's what I think, you know, that's what that's what Adam was interested in. And the great thing about Adam is he he's able to write um situ he's he's entertaining first first to the alpha and the omega of Adam is entertainment, you know? He's very focused on that. So and then he throws in all this incredibly rich material. So an audience can take it, leave it, whatever, but he never fails to be entertaining. And that is what's um 
that's what makes me feel just so safe and great to be back with him again is the guy knows how to the guy knows how to do it. And um, <laughs> you know, Danny was um, I think of, you know, for those who who watched Bloodline, Danny was um uh, you know, Danny was memorable, you know, Danny was memorable. And um and I think Christian is um is I've never loved anyone, you know, like the to play and to to be with than I have Christian. And the more the longer I stayed, the more in love with him I got, you know. And it seemed like one of the the great challenges for for Christian is that this is someone who, um, you know, whose whose entire life is sort of built on this idea of creating beauty, and it's interesting how he, he, that character has to work to maintain the ability to connect with beauty while yeah. dealing with the ugliness all around him. I mean, was yeah. that part of what intrigued you about the character? No, no. I mean, not, not to say no, to say that, that these were all the sort of the gifts that, that just kept being given. And, you know, as I, as I recounted earlier, the, the initial hook was just the idea of how you feel as the core person of yourself and how much you regret, um, you know, when you go out to this party that you act this certain way and aren't really you. You know what I mean? And putting that in the setting that we're in um, just augments it. But for Christian to be able to attempt to sort of to put beauty into the world, because he really just does want it, you know, he he just wants everything to stop. And we, of course, we're in the middle of Paris, in in the middle of the war, in the middle of the occupation. We don't know. We don't know it's going to end. We we don't know if it's going to continue. And this is it. You know, you you don't know in those situations. You know, you don't know when it's going to end. The the pandemic when it started, we didn't know how long it would go, or what it would do, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's really just about like, how do you endure that, and how do you hope to kind of do something with that? And Christian, just to go back to the the atelier thing that you were talking about. He wanted to design for 30 women only. And um, he, and th that was, you know, again, he yeah. had to meet reality because it's like, that's great, Christian, but uh, we're going to be doing something a little bigger than that. And he ends <laughs> up being, he, he's, a, he's a real hero in France in large, in, in no small part because he, he's, he helped usher in significantly the economic recovery because the amount of fabrics and stuff that he brought in and the, the work, et cetera, et cetera, and the degree to which that just went bam and exploded in the late 40s and into the 50s was a real driver in the recovery of... Um, of the French economy, and um, you know, and the, and I think the 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 enormous of relief, and he really did want to make the world beautiful, you know. Which, and we it's should say a, that uh, it it is that new look that he ushered in that gives the series its name. So yeah. I, I know that this is the question that probably actors hate getting, but it's. Sounds like Robin, Robin, you you've earned it. Your head critic, <laughs> you know, come on, you you can ask it. And I, it well, I... it sounds like you're very much uh, touched uh, a, a core within you. I mean, would you like to continue him for another season? Oh, I'd be delighted. I'd be delighted and contractually obligated. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, Perfect. honestly. <laughs> I, I, I was waiting. As soon as we'd had that conversation, I hung on to the idea that we we might be able to do this for five years. So, um, so you know, it's it's. I mean, if there's more to do, and there is more to do, but if people respond to it, and uh, and you know, I mean, I think that I, I'm getting the feeling that they will, and that they are, and um, uh, it will be uh, it will it will be my pleasure to uh, go back into it and. Try once again. Ah, perfect. Well, with that, uh, we are out of time. And I, I thank you very much for being with us today, Ben. Thank you so much, Rob. And thank you all for joining us. And for more conversations like this and other important conversations, please sign up for a Washington Post subscription. And you can get a free trial by visiting wapo.st backslash live. Once again, I'm Robin Gibbon, and thank you so much for being here.